Right, so how did you get the role of Jenny? And what did you think when you read the script? Okay. This is for Life Without George. I'm speaking to the wonderful actress Carol Royal today about her um, part in the, in the television programme. Hello, hi everybody. Um, well, I had been doing various bits of television and theatre by the time that Life Without George uh, had been written by Penny Croft, who of course was is David Croft's daughter, David Croft being the writer of things like uh, Hello, Hello and, um, uh, and Army. Black Army and all of that stuff. And um, uh, Susie Belbin, who was the producer and the director, had worked with Simon uh, Cadell on Hello, Hello. And also, <coughs> excuse me, Penny Croft's sister was married to Simon Cadell. So as far as they were concerned, it was kind of in the family. Now, because my father was a comedian and a farcer and um, had done an awful lot of theatre and some television, uh, they knew about him. You know, the Crofts knew about Daddy and they knew that I had a career going. So they knew that I was dad's daughter. So they got me in, I think, because of the connection, the, com the comic connection. And I met Susie and I met Penny and th that's, how I, that's how I got the job. Um, yeah, that's how I got the job. And what did I think of the script? I thought the scripts were great. Um, they were quite advanced for their time and she was very honest in her scripts. So she had sex uh, happening on the first date, which got you know, really jumped on by the uh, press. She had this gym, um, this woman who ran a gym club, a, a gymnasium uh, smoking, and, and that was jumped on by the press. And um, of course, it was at a time when AIDS was very much in the headlines. So to have a casual one night stand was jumped on by the press. <laughs> but but we did still manage. Also, I'd actually forgotten about that at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, know, I didn't smoke myself, actually, but she just wanted her to be a bit of a, you know, a bit of a independent wild girl, wild girl, I suppose. And, uh, and people loved it. And I think we got, you know, 10 million viewers or something. There were fewer channels in those days, of course, so not quite the choices that you used to have. But um, yeah, so I thought the scripts were great. And, uh, and, and, I, and I really, really liked Simon and I really liked Penny. So it was good. It was all good. Yeah, so so speaking of Simon, um, the Simon Cadell, he he was sort of known for sort of Heidi High and things at the time. So, um, you know, it was a very different role for him around that time. And, and what was your thought of that for for the choice of him? Well, the thing about being an actor is, if you're lucky, you're given a chance of doing all sorts of different things. I mean, I've done Shakespeare, I've done comedy, I've done sitcom, I've done soap opera. You know, uh, I've done drama. So I've done telly, I've done theatre, I've done, I haven't really gone into a film career, to be frank, but I have done filming for television. Um, and so that's what um, an actor is, if things go well, is given the choice to do a lots of variety of things. And of course, Simon had done Hello, Hello, and um, not uh, Hello, Hello, sorry, Heidi High. So he certainly was an experienced comic. He had a natural comic flair. And he was doing an awful lot of stuff at the National Theatre when we were working together. And he was doing drama and uh, comedy on stage. So, yeah, and, and you don't think anything of it when you meet another actor and they're playing something which is different, you know, because that's what being an actor <laughs> is all about. So, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... Um, you really look fabulous in the dance studio outfits you wore. And I wonder, did you get to keep any? And have you ever thought about setting up a, um, a Russell's motif wear clothing range, but with a word fictitious dance centre? Um, you know, added for all the fans out there of the show. I, I know I, for one, would, would have loved to have uh, had a oh, Russell's... Uh, oh, well... People maybe should have written in. It wouldn't have been my call. There would have been a copyright issue. I have no doubt. So, you know, a person who's just a sort of simple actor in a thing, they have no uh, call with regard to what merchandise might be put out there and stuff. If you're in a musical, 
there's often a lot of merch to do with that. If you're in the music industry, you've very often got a lot of merchandise with regard to that. And of course, if you become a huge star and you do something like Superwoman or, you know, one of those things, then the company will create little figurines and things, you know, with Spider-Man. Well, you certainly look like a, a Wonder Woman in, in your outfit. Oh, oh, gosh. Well, you compliment me. You flatter me. So um, the answer is no. <coughs> but there was somebody whom I knew um they were fans and she was called Jenny Russell and she asked me if I would be able to get a t-shirt for her and so uh, I went and asked their company would they do this as a sort of favor get a get a sweatshirt or whatever it was with Russell written on the front of it and um and and I sent that to her as a gift so it, that was just a kind of one-off though you know Oh gosh, lucky, lucky girl, um, and lucky to have the name. Even it was a uh, good choice. It's you know very believable. Um, right, it, it ran for three series, and as a star of a series like that, is it hard when you know it will unfortunately come to an end ultimately? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you always hope that when you're in a series that you're enjoying and is, is quite successful, that it'll just go on and on and on. And some of them do, of course, you know, they've got all the right ingredients and everything just sort of clicks like a jigsaw puzzle. And so it goes on and on and on and on. Um, but there's so many ingredients and not all of them was I party to. But the BBC would always be looking at new scripts and stuff and they would look at the ratings and they would look at this, that and the other, which I really don't know what it is. And then they would decide how long a series is going to go for. And what they had to take over from Life Without George was men behaving badly. And uh, so they took us off after three series and they put in men behaving badly instead. And of course, that ran and ran, I think, you know, for many, many years and made big big stars out of all of those three guys so it's just a question of luck and timing you know um and they obviously thought for whatever reason as I say actors uh, tend to not know about any of those things the, the nitty-gritty of the business side of stuff so they must have looked at something and thought actually we've we've done well with this we've had three series and and now we're going to put in something new and and you know maybe it was the right decision because men behaving badly just really did take off didn't it yeah yeah that, well, that did too yeah th i think all the comedies were pretty big at the time yeah. even yeah. sort of throw, throw off from the 70s i think it all sort of started you know late 60s um uh, a mandarin series uses a bottle of chanel um and now, was that a, a nod to uh, five? Uh, well, um, oh, I've lost you. You sort of, you're hanging. Um, you've gone kind of all still. I hope I get you back. Oh, you're back. You're back. Great. Um, I don't know what was in Penny's mind. She might have known I'd done a Chanel ad, which went on, on and on for seven years on the television, unbelievably, which was great. You know, help pay for the Christmas presents every year. Um, but hers was Chanel 5, I think, and mine was Chanel 19. So it wasn't, a specific, oh. it wasn't a specific nod to it. And also, you know, um, one has to be a bit careful here, but I um, was asked to do a shoot for them subsequent to the uh, commercial. And I got my then agent to ring and just, because, you know, things had evolved. I started off in 73 as a, as a, as a, as a vegetarian. Sorry, my emails are coming in. As a, I should have turned them off. As a veggie. I'm now a vegan. I have been for about seven or eight years. Um, but in those days, I was a veggie and had been since 73. And um, it was just sort of evolving for me that I had to be very mindful, wanted to be very mindful of all of the things that I use in terms of perfume and cosmetics. And I'd done the commercial for uh, Chanel 19 you know, quite some years before. Um, but I got my agent to ring when they asked me to do this next shoot and just ask them about the ingredients, etc. And I can't tell you what the answer was. Um, I never did hear. And even now it might be that it was perfectly fine. But all I can tell you is that I then didn't do 
the shoot. So we didn't have any more conversations. So maybe, <laughs> maybe they just thought I was a bit of a troublemaker and they'd let Carol Royal and Chanel go. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was lovely while it lasted. And when we shot that, um, uh, Carol, uh, what was he called? Carol Rice, who was a male film director, specifically wanted somebody who looked like a model, but was actually an actress. He didn't want a model. And I was just happy and uh, lucky enough to walk in and, and, and I sort of fitted the bill at that time. And we had a day's shoot and it was great and I enjoyed it. He then went on to make uh, French Lieutenant's Woman with Meryl Streep. And I often wondered if having mm. done the Chanel, the Chanel commercial had stymied my <laughs> chances for seeing him for anything else. But who knows? Mm. Um. Okay. Uh... Right. Regarding adverts, I feel hair care products as your hair and, and your, that of your daughter is simply stunning. Have you ever been asked? And do you think it's funny that you haven't, if, if that is the case? Um, I hadn't really thought about it before you posed the question. Um, I hadn't. I, I, I never said to myself, what a pity I'm not doing a hair commercial because now I... And that's, I'm, not really keen. I'm, not, I'm actually very keen on, you know, for actors, unless you're a huge star and you're doing a commercial because you're a star. And in those days, you tended not to do commercials because you were a big name. You tended to do commercials because you needed the job. And to go up for commercials is a rather soul destroying experience. You know, you feel a little bit like a horse because they, you know, they need to, they practically need to look at your teeth. So I wasn't wild about going up for commercials. I, I didn't have to go up for, the, for the, the Chanel one. I just went and met Carol, you know. It wasn't that whole horrible stand in front of the camera, tell us your name, how tall are you? Let us look you from the left, let us look from you the right, take your socks off so we can look at your big toe. I mean, they, they, that's what going up for commercials can be like. So mm -hmm. I didn't really play at that game. So I wasn't really bothered about not doing them. and. Um, it hasn't occurred to either me or my daughter that we perhaps should have or might have. In fact, my hair was somewhat of a problem because um, I remember when I was doing Life Without George, the television critic woman, I believe she's called Nina Mishkov, uh, she wrote a, 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 wrote a review about me. Now, I might be speaking out of turn, so if I'm wrong about this, don't, 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 um, blame me for it but I think it was Nina Mishkov who said that I because at the opening titles of uh, Life Without George you may remember that mm. we're in a kind of cafe and I sort of hold his hand the fictitious George and um and and he and and she wrote Carol Royal of the ham-sized hands that was the first thing the first flattering critique she gave of me and the next one was, and as I say, forgive me if I'm confusing. I know she said, I think she said definitely the hair thing, which I'm about to tell you. She might have been somebody else about who said Carol Royal of the ham-sized hands, but my memory is that it was she who said both. I may be wrong. And she said uh, about something, she said, um, um, the jokes in Life Without George are all aimed at her bottom which is where her hair falls. I have seen enough of Carol Royal's hair to last me a lifetime. <laughs> so, these are the kind of things that, you know, go on and you have to try and deal with them as an actor, but they can be a bit hurtful. And you think, well, why, why? I mean, you know, she obviously just had a big problem, but I think she's quite, I think she can be quite scathing, Nina Mishkov, and she was with me. Um, she was very, uh, she has been, I've seen, very scathing to some people. Um, there was one actress in particular who took her to court and it was all yeah. pleasant. But, um, so yeah, the hair can be a bit of a, you know, two-way thing. Sometimes, it, well, it's very useful to have long hair because if you need to wear, have short hair, it's because my hair, I had a lot of it. I have less of it these days, but I had a lot of it, um, but it was very fine. So it was very easy to get under a, a wig if you needed to. It was also really great to put up and have it up. 
And then if you wanted it to be down, you could have it down or you could have it halfway up and down. So I figured having long hair was pretty practical for an actress. It gives you more opportunity. Well, so, yeah, whereas if you've just got really short hair, it's either short all the time or you've got a wig all the time. Whereas for me, you know, mm. and I also yeah. resented that, you know, some people would say you should cut your hair. And I thought, well, why should I really prostitute myself? Just because mm. people think that that's what I should do. You know, I want to be me. I'm Carol Royal and I've got long hair at least at the moment. So I remember going up for a film or it was a television series, I think. And this guy said, it's going to be shooting in Africa. It's very hot in Africa. We'd like you to cut your hair, will you? And I went, well, no, actually. And to be frank, it's much more practical to have longer hair because then you can take it all up and it's much cooler because it's off your neck. Whereas if you've got <laughs> hair down to here, it's more difficult to scrape up and it's jolly, jolly warm. Anyway didn't get the part so yes, um, quite, quite right. um so yeah the hair has always been a bit of an issue uh certainly remember the Nina, Nina Mishkov uh critique um and uh and yeah, I, I know that she she used to do some uh, judging of uh you know new stars and shows and everything years ago and mm -hmm. and um yeah like you said if she likes you she likes you but if she doesn't I think you're in for quite a hard ride. Yeah, she goes so, to the jugular. And, you know, I'm a fairly decent human being. I, I don't really believe in being nasty to anybody. Uh, no, unless, there's a, unless there's a jolly good reason for it. And um, so I'd be a, ho a hopeless critic, I would. <laughs> Actually, um, we're coming up to half past four. I I'm just a bit nervous, but let's... Okay, let's okay. If we suddenly... Um, get right, without... Off, okay. If we suddenly got cut off in okay. our time, we could do another meeting, perhaps. Uh, okay. Uh, without going, um, giving away any spoilers, your role involved a few accidents. Um, did any hurt? And is it scary being put in harm's way like that? Because you, um, you, you cope yeah. with it very well. It wasn't, wasn't good for me watching. I was thinking, oh, my goodness, poor, poor Jenny Russell. Um. It's all part of the job and you do when you're at drama school, you learn uh, unarmed combat and tumbling and um, fencing and, you know, you, it's part of the training. And my father, who was a farceur, so he was a tumbler. He used to work with Brian Ricks in town for many, many years and do all Ray Cooney and John Chapman's farces, you know, falling on his bottom. That was his thing. Um, and I did a fast last year, one of Ray Cooney's farces. I didn't have to actually fall on my bottom at all, but it's all rough and tumble and it's great fun. So it's part of the job. You have to just, if you're going to do a fight or something or a fall or bump into a lamppost, you've got to practice it over and over, you know. The worst thing are when you have little accidents that are, that are by accident. Uh, you know, I had to keep, I had a, I did an episode of something, I can't remember what it was now, but I was a murderer in it and I was incognito, so you couldn't see who I was. And I had all this stuff all up my arm, so you couldn't see it was a woman's arm. And I had to pull on this great big electric PowerPoint. And that I got a really bad shoulder through. And then I was doing a play, Ideal Husband Action, at the end of the act, I fell to my knees every night in anguish about what, what had just happened in the first act. And I ended up with really sore knees at the end of the tour after three months. Oh. Like that, you know, those you haven't sort of thought about. You haven't kind of planned in advance. So you can get in injured in that way. Um, but with the things that are actually written in a script, funnily enough, you you plan those. It's the unplanned things that are the problem. <laughs> oh, right. OK. Um, right. There, there were quite a few actors from Liverpool um, in Life Without George. And um, how was it to work with Elizabeth Estenson, the uh, oh, it was live lovely. bird? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was great. Um, she was smashing. She came in in the uh, second series, taking over from Ros March, who'd been in the first, playing Amanda. And she was super. And we got on like a house on fire. And we became, and our families became really good buddies for a long time. But then, of course, she migrated up north to Emmerdale. And her life, you know, just became about uh, doing, doing that show. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm, we've lost contact therefore, uh, which I'm very sad about because I hate losing contact with people who've been good friends. But I think when you're on a soap opera like that, it just eats you up, you know, it's just really intense. 
And uh, I think that um, life has to change for you a bit consequently. But it was great while it lasted. Great. Yeah, she was she was really good to sort of, uh, you know, our ideal candidate, really, to take over from. Yeah. Yeah, the other Amanda because she uh, she 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 pulled it off flawlessly, didn't she? Yeah, really? Yeah, no, she's she's great. She was great, and a really really. She had a lot to go on though, because Amanda was such a sort of um, um, you know interesting character. There were so yeah. many uh, facets of her that were easy to sort of pick up on. I should think yeah, being yeah, an yeah, actress yeah. that you could great. copy, you know, to to yeah. make it seem more like her. Great character. Trait. Um, yeah. Right. So is there, sorry, uh, is there a role you would have loved but have um, not done yet? Um, I, there are so many, you know, I can't even talk about them. But the, the two that come to mind is when I was at um, an amateur company before I went to drama school, I went to drama school in 73. And I was with a lovely amateur company in London, central London, called the Stanhope. In fact, I met Alan Rickman there. He was at RADA at the time. And just after I left there, I went off to central. And when I was part of that amateur company, I did, uh, I played Hermione in Shakespeare's Winter's Tale. And I always wanted to play her professionally. And, um, I nearly, I, I, well, maybe I didn't nearly, but when I was playing um, Titania in Midsummer Night's Dream at Regent's Park in 1986, they were also going to do um, a Winter's Tale. And I really hoped that I would get Hermione, but somebody else did. So I have still never played Hermione. And of course, you know, I'm too old for it now, but there we are. And the other thing- No, that, definitely not. Well, yeah. Definitely she, not, it hasn't yes, changed. She's just had a baby, so it's a bit beyond the beyond, beyond the stretch of the imagination. Now, and the other one I would love to have done is Blanche Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire. God, named so, Desire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Love yeah. to play that. I would love to play that. Yeah, I, I saw um, Mel Martin do that. Oh, really? So, um, where did you? Yeah. Where did you do it? Um, that was in Basingstoke. Oh, right. Many years ago. So, to uh, and. Uh, Ralph Arliss, uh, who played um, Blackie Johnson in Love for Lydia alongside her, he he was, you know, um, playing oh, the Marlon oh, Brando oh, part. Right, right, right. Because she's married to John Dutton now. And uh, John and I did a series called The Outsider. Um, really fun. Yorkshire. A Yorkshire, about a, a Yorkshire newspaper. So, yeah, so, so, yeah all the, all the, all the um, strings tie up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a small world. Um. Right. Uh, although uh, Life Without George was set in the 80s, um, I just recently heard a news report of uh, someone gate crashing Britney Spears' wedding. So oh, the oh. graduate scene is ever present. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, she's just recently got married, has she, Britney Spears? Um, again, I think, I, I don't know, but right. all I heard on the radio was definitely, you know, oh, right. uh, sort of, I think a previous bow was uh, oh, right. trying to gate oh. crash. Yeah. Yes, well, yes, I did do that in Life Without George, didn't I? Well, all I can say is, I mean, it would take somebody who... But it sort of happened twice, didn't it? In Life Without George? Yeah. No, right. not just you, but there was, there was... Um, you know, I'm trying not to give away any spoilers, but but there was two 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 times when uh, in that that there was that sort of scene. Right, right, right. Oh yes, yes, yes. I know what you mean. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, I can only say that. Um, would I agree with it? Well, no, because you've got to be really, really rather desperate to do something as extraordinary as that. But at the same time, I totally understand people whose, whose energies and emotions make them feel like they'd want to. I understand all that, but the difference between kind of madness and humanity <laughs> is having the feeling and actually doing the thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, um, well, that that brings me to the end of my questions for oh, today. Well, we've done it. We've done it. We've done it in 